There's a lady called Susie Becker. She's an author and an illustrator. And she teamed up with a group of early primary age children and she actually asked them how they thought they could make the world better. The book she released is called The All Better Book. Becca poses an issue to these children and then she asks the children how they would solve that issue. One of the issues she asked the kids if, she could, if they could help solve was how could they help people quit smoking? Alexis, aged eight, said, go to a smoker's house, pretend to smoke and die. That's commitment. I probably would have just smoked and then pretended to die, but this is probably far more effective. Another issue, another issue that was posed to these children. Too many people spend hours at jobs where they're unhappy. What suggestions would you give their bosses? Yasina, age nine, said this, get bosses to give their workers Five hour breaks. This kid will go a long way. <laughs> On the issue of what to do with lawbreakers, a seven year old named Lily said, make them do gymnastics for a month. <laughs> Obviously, Lily is not a fan of gymnastics. <clears throat> and then there's this one. There are billions of people in the world. Someone should be able to figure out a system where no one is lonely. What do you suggest? Little kids came up with their answers. This is for Kalina, aged eight. She said this, people should find lonely people and ask their name and address, and then ask people who aren't lonely their name and address. When you have an even amount of each, assign lonely people with not lonely people together in the newspaper. And this from Matt, aged eight. We could get people a pet, or a husband, or a wife, <laughs> and then take them places. I particularly like the order. Pet first, can't get one of those, go look for a husband. Um, and then take them places. Not quite sure what those places are. This past year has been described as a year of disruption, dislocation, and disconnection. And people in many communities are experiencing loneliness as never before. And loneliness is serious. Some of you might remember that in 2018, the British Prime Minister, Theresa May, appointed a minister for loneliness in her cabinet. The minister for loneliness was to tackle the social and health issues caused by social isolation. A British report that had been released the year before in England uh, stated that loneliness was as harmful to health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. It also found that more than 9 million people in the UK often describe themselves as being lonely or always lonely. In an article in the Harvard Business Review titled Work and the Loneliness Epidemic in September 2017, Vivek Murphy, who served as the Surgeon General of the United States for a number of years, wrote that the most common pathology he saw as a doctor was not heart disease or diabetes or cancer. It was loneliness. Just people alone. He said this, it has more than doubled since the 1980s, that well over 40% of Americans report suffering from loneliness at significant levels. And experts expect that actual total is considerably higher because people are just reluctant to say, I feel lonely. John Ortberg tells the story of a woman who phoned a friend and asked how she was doing. Terrible came the reply. I have a massive headache. My back and my legs are killing me. The house is a mess. The kids are driving me crazy. I feel so alone. Very sympathetically, the caller said, you go and lie down and rest. I'm going to come over right away. I'll cook lunch. I'll clean the house. I will take care of the children while you get some rest. 
By the way, how's your, your husband Sam doing? The woman on the other end of the phone said, Sam? My, my husband's name isn't Sam. Oh dear, the caller replied. I must have called the wrong number. There was a long pause and then the lady on the other end of the call added, does this mean you're not coming over? Ortberg makes this observation. What has changed in our world is not the burden of health or the burden of parenting or the burden of addiction or the burden of failure or the burden of loss. Those things have always existed. What has changed is that no one is coming over. We live in a world of unbelievable, amazing, financial, educational, vocational and technological opportunity, but no one is coming over. I think he's right. Many people know the feeling of nobody coming over. I think that there are those in the church who know that feeling. And certainly there are those in our city who really know that feeling. My hope is that this church community, this church community will offer opportunity to connect and belong. That no matter a person's background or status, beliefs or lack of, they will find welcome and a place amongst us. I think it's true that while many people, when they hear the word church, think of a place you go or a service you attend, Jesus had much more in mind. I think while many people, when they hear the word church, think of a place you go or a service you attend, Jesus had much more in mind. Not a biological family, but a spiritual family. One time, Jesus was told that his mother and his brothers were looking for him. And this was his response. Who are my mother and my brothers? He asked. And then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and he said, here are my mother, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. Chris Kadir lectures on justice, hospitality and mission. <clears throat> Excuse me. At Regent's Park College, Oxford University, at Regent College, Vancouver. He wrote an article in Christianity Today entitled, Church is a Family, Not an Event. And he says this, <clears throat> Unfortunately, in many places, people subconsciously hold the idea that church is an event where religious goods and services are dispensed. He says this, We talk about going to church more often than we talk about being the church. And he poses this question. What would happen if instead of an overemphasis on the church as an event where religious goods are dispensed in a transactional agreement, we were to adopt the biblical metaphor of the church as a family? That is the household of God. And we use this metaphor, the household of God, as the primary influence on our idea and practice of church. <clears throat> He goes on to share, church as a family is not a new metaphor. However, our understanding of church as family may have become so restricted, limited and skewed that it needs an urgent rethink. He says, this particularly struck home to me when I was in Kenya, listening to a Christian from the north of the country giving his testimony. This man had become Christian from a strongly Muslim background and as a result, he had to leave his home and then he had to flee his community for fear of his life. He sought sanctuary in a church that welcomed him with open arms. They gave him a corner of the building to live in with a mattress on the floor. And every day, food was generously delivered. This man was extremely grateful for their hospitality. But he confided that the hardest part of the week was on Sunday morning after the church service when everyone went home to their families and their Sunday lunches, leaving him alone in the building. Although he was welcome to make his home inside of the church building, 
He did not actually feel welcome inside the homes of the church family. This church was so near and yet so far from Christ-like hospitality. What would it mean for us as Hume Ridge to shift our thinking from church as an event to church being family? Ortberg draws our attention to the fact that the New Testament writers had a phrase that they seem to love. He says, in fact, it occurs over 59 times in commands in the New Testament. It is the phrase, one another. Jesus was creating a family of what might be called one anotherness. Statements like, be at peace with one another, honour one another, wash one another's feet, submit to one another, speak truth to one another, be devoted to one another, encourage one another and spur one another on to love and good deeds. It's important to pause here. For I realise that for some, their experience of family has not been easy or fair. And I would say that it's true that for some of you, your experience of family is a long way from what God ever intended family to be. The one another's are the way we are supposed to do family. Loving one another where that is expressed in being patient and kind not envying or boasting, not proud, never dishonouring one another, not self-seeking, not easily angered, and not keeping a record of wrongs. Biblical love is protective. It's hopeful and it perseveres. Biblical love is about forgiving. It's about believing the best, not the worst. It's about giving people the benefit of the doubt and it's about trusting. These should be the qualities and the characteristics of a family. And these should be the qualities and the characteristics of this church. There are multiple other examples in the Bible's teaching that portray the church as a family. Paul instructs his apprentice Timothy as a young leader that he should treat older women as mothers, younger women as sisters, older men as fathers and younger men as brothers. 1 Timothy chapter 5. And this is typical of Paul's teaching and example. At the end of his letter to the Romans, Paul sends his greetings to the church and specifically asks to be remembered to his sister Phoebe and to Rufus's mother, who has also been a mother to me. According to Jesus in Luke chapter 18, those who convert to Christianity at great relational cost will receive many times more brothers, sisters, parents and children in the present age. How is this possible? It's through the alternative family of the church that we receive relationships that can act as a substitute for those that we may have lost. My hope for Hume Ridge is that we more and more will shift from seeing church as an event something we come to and then go from, to seeing church as a family, something we do. That those who are inside us, who've been part of this place for many years, those who are already in relationship with God through Jesus, his son, might know that connection in a very strong way and sense that they have a belonging here, that they belong here. And that those who are on their way not yet sure about what it means to know God for themselves and have a relationship with him through his son Jesus, would also know that they belong and that they are connected here. I want to, for a few moments, just spend a bit of time looking at this deal, this word hospitality. I have to admit that my understanding of this word was in past really limited. I knew from years of being in the church that Paul in his writings to Timothy and to Titus had put in his list of qualifications for a leader this deal about being hospitable. 1 Timothy 3, 1 to 4 says this, Paul writing to Timothy, here is a trustworthy saying, whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. 
Now, the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him. And he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. In his letter to Titus, he says this, Since an overseer, a leader, manages God's household, he must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, rather, he must be hospitable. One who loves what is good who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it's been taught so he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. Can I say to you that I knew hospitable made the list, but I really had no idea why. I knew that hospitable made the list, but it really seemed to be a bit lightweight compared to self-controlled, or holy, or able to teach. But then I found out what Paul was meaning when he used the word hospitable. And it was a whole lot more than I had understood. John Ortberg explains it like this. Trying to translate between languages is is tricky. And the concept of hospitality is a prime example of what is missed between one language and another. Based on our English definition, most people would consider themselves hospitable. However, the Greek term that is often translated into the English term, hospitality, is this word that's on your screen. And that word is a combination of two concepts that break down as as follows. The first part is pronounced philio. And it is one of several words for, the love, for love in Greek. Being a more precise language than English, classical Greek has few different ways to express the word love. And in this case, the word that is used means brotherly love or to love like a brother. And it is how they get the name Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. The second part of the word that's used for hospitality <clears throat> is the word xenos, which makes up the second half of the word that we render hospitality. And it actually means stranger or immigrant. And it's where we get the word xenophobia, which is the fear of strangers or immigrants. In light of these two words being combined, hospitality as commonly understood isn't exactly the best way to express this biblical truth. Instead of simply entertaining guests, the word becomes one who loves strangers and immigrants like you would love your own brother. That's a big difference. That completely changes the way we see this term used in Scripture. That definition and understanding gives the word a greater depth of meaning and I believe a far greater degree of challenge. For me to be hospitable is to do far more than just take those I get on well with for coffee. For me to be hospitable is to do far more than just invite those I have a lot in common with and find it easy to be with over for a meal. For me to be hospitable in a biblical sense is to have a major shift in how I view and act towards those who could be described as strangers immigrants, refugees. It is to see and treat them as I would those closest to me, my family. If I'm going to be true to what I believe this word is teaching, it is for me to shift in my thinking and it is for me to act in a very different way. And before any of you relax, can I just say this? Hospitality should not be seen as something that is optional or nice, but not that necessary. And it should not be seen as something that should only be practiced by those in leadership positions in the church. 
Hospitality plays no small role in the realm of biblical ethics. Biblical warnings urge the Israelites and the early Christians to practice this virtue. Its practice characterized Abraham. Read Genesis 18. And it characterizes what is expected of Christian leaders, Titus and Timothy. And hospitality is an attribute of God. Hospitality has been, ma- has been described as making space for people that you don't have to make space for. Hospitality has been described as making space for people that you don't have to make space for. And in this, God is the inventor and lead actor. My hope is that we, Hume Ridge, might embody hospitality. That in the coming weeks and months, there would be a consistent, committed effort to do hospitality well. Can I ask you to look around? Look around. Can I ask you to be ready to notice and to take initiative? Respond to God's promptings. In the past three weeks, I have met people who are just starting out with us. They are looking, hoping for a way to connect. They are hoping that you'll make space for them. I met a young lady three weeks ago, very intelligent. She is studying at a master's level at university. She is very committed in her faith. She has been coming here since we came back into the building in October. But she always left as soon as the service finished because she was concerned that her English wasn't good enough. And she told me she felt that others wouldn't want to talk to her because she felt that they would struggle to understand everything she said. So last week... I introduced her to Bob and Denise. And guess what? She was one of the last to leave the building. They talked and talked. And those of us who know Bob and Denise, what a surprise. They are some of our best talkers. She stayed because someone stayed with her. She stayed because someone stayed with her stayed and made the effort to really listen, was patient, was kind, was keen to hear her story. And I want to say to you that she has now made the decision to connect with a life group. She has decided that she wants to be part of it. Which brings me to life groups. Here's the deal. Others will try their best to help you connect in. But if you really want to feel connected and belong, one step you can take is to sign up to a life group. I want to say to you that we would love you to be part of a life group in this church. We would love you to feel like you are known and you know others. We would love you to be part of a small group where you can do life together. Life groups provide significant opportunities to develop deeper relationships, to be cared for and to care for others. Life groups in this church are without doubt our first line of pastoral care. It's where real connections can occur and develop. So today, I really want to encourage you to please sign up. Or if you're unsure about life groups, talk to one of the ministry team who are going to be all in the foyer at the end of the service, ready to listen and ready to try to help. Don't leave until you've asked someone about how it could look for you if you're unsure. Talk to them about what happens in a life group. I want to say to you that personally, I know that reflecting on 2020, my Tuesday night life group was extremely important in helping me keep perspective. They supported me and they encouraged me. Last term of 2020, the last three months of 2020, I conducted five funerals. Three of them were suicides. One of them was a death in custody. And the other lady was 40 years of age who died of cancer, leaving two small children. It's my life group that hear about those funerals. They hear me speak my sadness. They pray for me and they check in to hear how I'm doing. 
I know I need a life group. I know that as I seek to know God better and serve him, I need people around me who will help me and support me. We weren't meant to do this deal on our own. The opportunity today is to sign up. For those of you in the building, there'll be opportunity out in the foyer. People will be on iPads and will be able to help you. But for those of you who are watching online, and we're so pleased you're with us, you can sign up for a life group by going to our website, clicking on the hello button, and then scrolling down to connect, and then hitting the life group section, which will take you to a life group sign-up page. Give it a go. Try it for a term. If it doesn't work for you, we'll give you a refund. <laughs> the second opportunity today is the opportunity to volunteer in the life of the church. The bottom line today is that we need your help. And I think this is the way we are meant to do church. Each of us has a part. Each of us has something to contribute that is significant and important in helping the church be in God's mission. I love the part that Emma read. Ephesians 2. God is building a home. He's using all of us, irrespective of how we got here, in what he's building. He used the apostles and prophets for the foundation. Now he's using you, fitting you in brick by brick, stone by stone, with Jesus Christ as the cornerstone that holds all parts together. We see it taking shape day after day, a holy temple built by God, all of us built into it, a temple in which God is quite at home. God is building a home. And we each have something to contribute to what God is building. Each of us has something different that we can do. From making coffees on a Sunday morning that just give people a reason to stick around and connect, to driving buses that help kids get to programs and hear that there's a God and he loves them. To kids ministry leaders, to gardening teams, to life group leading, to teaching English, to refugees, to homework help volunteers, youth leaders. Here on the screen is a bit of a list. I'm going to ask for it to stay up for a few minutes. It's not the full list, but it's some. There is a place. There is a place for you and we need your help. So today, can I ask you, consider signing up. Again, the ministry team are going to be in the foyer ready to do their best to answer your questions. Any questions you might have in regard to volunteer opportunities. Again, for those online, please go to our website, Go to next steps, go down to the box that says serving, volunteering, and then tick the comment box and leave a message regarding your interest in volunteering in an area. Later on in, a, in the service, you're going to hear from some of those in our church who volunteer and particularly you're going to hear the reasons why they volunteer. It's worth listening to. The volunteers in this place, in this church are remarkable. They are why so much happens. And it's also true that volunteering can be helpful in terms of connecting and having a sense of belonging. Knowing that you're part of helping something happen that can make it an eternal difference in the lives of others is a big deal. Knowing that you're part of what God is building and that he's using you gives incredible significance to what you are part of. Every part, every role is important and has values. So today, as we wrap up, can I simply say that let's get on with being hospitable. Let's go out of our way to be hospitable and start today. Because if you don't today, you probably won't. Start today. Because if you don't today, you probably won't. After the service, Jen and I are taking flowers to a single mum of refugee background. Today's her birthday. And in talking with her earlier this week, we just talked a little bit and she told me it was her birthday and not much is happening today for her. So we're coming over. We're going to drop flowers. I've even written a card. She doesn't know that we're coming. And we will simply leave the flowers on the doorstep if she's not there. Am I busy today? Yep. Do I have time for this? Of course I do. Here's the truth about me. 
I can always make time for what I want to. So can you. So today, because um, you're here, I want to leave this challenge with you. If you don't today, you probably won't. Let's get on with seeking to see church, not as an event we attend, but as family. A family marked by one another's. It will matter. Please hear these words again from the book of Ephesians. That's plain enough, isn't it? That's plain enough. You're no longer wandering exiles. This kingdom of faith is now your home. You're no longer strangers or outsiders. You belong here with as much right to the name Christian as anyone. God is building a home. He's using us, irrespective of how we got here in what he's building. He's using the apostles and prophets for the foundation. Now he's using you, fitting you in brick by brick, stone by stone with Jesus Christ as the cornerstone that holds all the parts together. We see it taking shape day after day. A holy temple built by God, all of us built into it. A temple in which God is quite at home. So I am a HR Kids leader and a Stompies leader. Um, and the reason why I serve is because when I was growing up, I had heaps of incredible leaders in my life and people in my life who just showed me what Christianity was all about and just Jesus' love. And I really want to be that person for younger kids and younger girls that I lead as well. So just being leader to be able to be that person for others. I serve in the cleaning team. And it's really important for me because it provides a very clean and welcoming environment to new people and to people who've been coming for a long time. It's part of being in God's house. I'm involved in the meeting and greeting roster on Sunday mornings. Uh, I'm also involved with the homework help program on Tuesday afternoons after, that's after school and uh, also in organising the Grumpo's lunches on a monthly basis for older and or retired men. Uh, as to why I do that, um, it's just part of what I like to do. I just believe in uh, interacting with people, sharing life with people, doing life with people, and hopefully contributing to the well-being of other people and encouraging people in the process. So I serve at the youth group, and the reason why I served is because um, Ross picked me up in grade four and yeah, I've just been here since then and like now that I've finished school it's just been like a great experience and just like growing with God and like helping kids. I serve in uh, one of the coffee teams. Uh, I love it. I do that uh, as a way of serving. God asks us to serve and I enjoy uh, meeting the people, chatting to them. I also serve in the coffee team um, and I thought that was a weird gifting that I had and I wasn't sure how to use it for God, but it's been awesome to be able to serve on a Sunday morning, um, just making coffees for people and interacting in that way. Uh, last year I finished leading at Stumpy's and I'm starting to lead at youth this year. Um, I also help out at Homework Help. Um, when I was in youth, I had really good leaders that made me feel welcomed and they loved me um, no matter what, so I just want to be that person for some people. So I serve on the tech team and I've also previously served um, as a youth leader and also on the worship team. Um, a big thing, thing for me is that serving is part of me being in, actively involved in the church. Um, it's a way that I can use the natural gifts that God's given me in ways that I can help other people get to know God better. Um, but even just, I've really found good friends through, um, through the ways that I've served. So I've met some of my best friends through serving. So it's a really good way to plug into the church as well. And so I serve in youth ministry and in the worship ministry and I serve because I believe it's what God has called us to do and um, yeah just because I enjoy doing it and I believe he's given us gifts and talents to serve in certain areas. 